New age hoochie boochie woo woo. New age hoochie boochie woo. New age hoochie boochie woo woo. A new age hoochie boochie woo. Come on. That's that's the new theme song. What do you think? <laughs> okay. Uh, that threw me off for a moment. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Uh, Keeping you on your toes. Keeping you on your toes. What are we doing here today? Oh, uh, well, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're the Crypto Science Society, and we explore different paranormal subjects and topics, and today we're talking about mysterious animal deaths, and in particular, a 2009 case of cow mutilations in the San Luis Valley. Yay. Woo, who, such an interesting topic. Who am I? <laughs> you are Jason Cordova, and I am Janae Conrad. It's good to be here. Yeah. How, it's been a while. It's been, yes, it's been a little while. You you were lost in the time stream. Yes, I and found my way back. And finally uh, got a lock on you, pulled you back into our reality. Well, I don't know. You're the one who left. Uh, well, I went to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent a couple weeks in Japan and had some good, got some good stuff there too. Awesome. Some good adventures. Good. Uh, Savannah and I collecting, collecting some stories. Perfect. Which we'll have to do a whole episode on sometime soon. That'd be awesome. Um. Well, I feel like we can't kind of move on before one. We acknowledge that it's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, the moon landing, the real, actual moon landing that actually really happened. And this isn't sarcasm, folks. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, which <laughs> there, there, there's quite a few people out there who definitely are on the conspiracy train, thinking that the moon landing was faked. I kind of think uh, it's, uh, it would have been. At this point, I'm convinced that it would have been easier to actually land on the moon to than it. to fake it. Yeah, right? I agree. Uh, and that all comes out from, like, basically one guy wrote a book, and all of the conspiracy theories around that have, like, just blossomed. Awesome. Which seems to be the case for most things. There seems to be, like, a one key person, and then things just kind of dovetail from there yeah, yeah well in terms of like kind of going on the conspiracy train a little bit um i'm sure everyone is aware of the area 51 storming the gates thing that yeah. has happened and we've gotten a lot of memes from it which i have found rather i'm just amazed at sort of like the cultural phenomenon that just like blipped out of this yeah my favorite one is the one that shows uh, brent spiner's data like next to mark zuckerberg Oh, that's hilarious. Saying Mark Zuckerberg stage, is staging it to go rescue his dad from Area 51. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and they look a lot of like... I was listening to NPR actually on my way back down um, to Denver, and one of the things I was hearing is the guy who kind of created this um, event actually now wants to do a music festival. So part of me is wondering if it was just a big marketing plan. Yeah. So from what I understand, uh, the way I interpret it was that it just kind of started as a joke, and it just like... Well, nobody was really expecting it to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. and then like, it now was. we've got over a million people, which means like maybe seven people show up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a million people responded. They're going on Facebook, so yeah, you can expect a fraction of that fraction, to actually like show not up. Not even a fraction. But like my cousin Alejandro, he he responded is interested, <laughs> like kind of interested to go see what's gonna go on. Uh, a lot of the the. Uh, UFO researchers are uh, in the network have been um, kind of advocating like let's let's do something with this. Obviously, there's some some momentum. Yeah. Like, let's do something positive and productive, and not break the law yeah. and um, illegally enter a government facility. Uh, and a lot of things to be taken into account with that, like the the point of like no return, like the the actual area that you are not permitted to go beyond mm -hmm. it's still miles away from the actual facility yeah well and that's a probably a lot of people don't take that into consideration or just how how strategically placed area 51 and is set up but also too just sort of like how things have really changed with area 51 like it's had so much media attention over the years mm -hmm. we don't even really know like what kind of facility it is anymore right um well from from what we do know though is that it? It was a 
it was a, a, a test facility for like Lockheed Skunk Works mm -hmm. and the CIA. For, right. Uh, um, so a lot of stuff did go down. Actual, yeah, actually testing, you know, black projects, secret aircraft, that kind of thing. And we know, uh, you know, there's some speculative stuff. You know, some people have come forward, like Bob Lazar, saying that they worked there and did, you know, Bob Lazar specifically claims that he worked on Bio, like back, back engineering, engineering. Uh, an alien spacecraft and like well if if that's true awesome but i don't think it's there anymore and yeah. most people recognize it like it's been a while since it's been actually that operational operational so that brings us to another point though like if if it is you know where where is the good stuff mm -hmm. if there is any alien where is it? Where is it hanging out? Uh, or, or we'll just we'll even objectively call it exotic materials, mm -hmm. right? unknown origin substances, kind of thing. Um, yes. Well, and I, yeah, I kind of think about that too. I was like, because we have there's like Cheyenne Mountain, and I always have been more intrigued with that. But you were talking before we even got on the podcast how a lot of things have been dispersed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things have like were coalesced for a long amount of time, and then kind of scattered and spread out so i think if anything things are a bit more segmented so p if anything were to be going on i think it's just like a very small puzzle piece mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of having a lot located in one location well and that's exactly what's kind of coming to light with all the news about atip yeah and the uh, it was the the pentagon program the advanced aerial threat protection program that was run by lou elizondo and now with to the stars of canopy and tom DeLong and Chris Mellon and mm -hmm. all those awesome people. Which we're bummed we couldn't get tickets to the Blink no, 182, 182 concert. It's so expensive. Yeah. I'm so bummed. <laughs> Anywho, yeah. but, we still need to do a punk rock or alien yeah, episode. Yeah, we're going to do a punk rock alien episode. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe we can pull in some strings and see if I can get, get Tom as a guest. That would be awesome. <laughs> I don't know like how, what strings could you pull? I, well... My cousin Alejandro knows uh, <laughs> everyone. Knows uh, Lou Elizondo. He's like they talk. A they, lot. They're, they're 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 on a good professional. They've got a good professional That's relationship. That's good. Yeah. Right, a working relationship. So maybe at the upcoming UFO Congress, yeah, we're gonna go out there. Maybe we'll get get a chance to. When is that? It's in August. It's the actually the first weekend of September. It's first weekend of so that I will be gone. I'll be in Oklahoma. Dang. Well, I'm gonna try to get out there, okay. and I'm gonna try to work, work the sh work the show with with. Because that's Labor Day and, weekend, right? Uh, First weekend. These ho holidays. Holiday. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, holiday. Isn't that something you put on? You put on eggs. <laughs> No, it's a thing where you take a day off of work, supposedly. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, that thing. Yeah, if it's Labor Day weekend, I will be with my friend Nakona. Okay, cool. Um, well, enjoy. But for those of you who aren't going to be spending the weekend with Janae's friend, <laughs> come, come uh, to the to San the, Luis Valley. Well, August. actually, no, it's in. That's in Phoenix. Oh, it's in Phoenix. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, the International UFO Congress. I guess I always get that because, like, Huntington, August Arizona. is such a hot spot in terms of UFO watching mm -hmm. in San Luis Valley. I always get those, like, mixed well, up. Well, I do think, yeah. So, Judy Meslin at the UFO Watchtower down in Hooper, San Luis, Colorado, where uh, much of our, our investigation upcoming takes place. Uh, investigation takes place. Um, they consistently have done a... Labor Day weekend or mm -hmm. Memorial Day? Labor Day. Memorial Day is May. Okay. Labor Day is September. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so that, that one holiday that happens in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has <laughs> that off. That has Monday off. <laughs> um, which is kind of a nice segue, too, in terms of, like, the this particular case that we're going to talk about in terms of cow, uh, specific, like, cow mutilation happens in the San Luis Valley. And to give some, like, background, I know we've talked about the San Luis Valley in the past, but... Um, Jason and I are both, our families are both from there and lived there for, uh, quite a while. Uh, Jason more so, <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my family was there first. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and so, and what's, uh, Alamosa is really just like interesting place in general. Like the, the, I can never, 
remember the mountain's names. I don't know why. Mount Blanco. Thank you. The, uh, the Sangre de Cristo. <clears throat> yeah. And so, like, um, a lot of, and so just in terms of, like, the area, it's considered, like, uh, the valley is considered pretty sacred. Um, it was, like, a big meeting spot for a long time for different indigenous communities. Um, and then... And then, like, it's just been a really interesting hub of activity in general. There's been a lot of UFO sightings, um, cow mutilations, different anomalous activity out there. So it's been a big spot for investigation for a long time. And so there, we have, like, a lot of really good material there. And since it's in our backyard, in many ways, it's one of the places we've been able to travel. That was a glass. I just dropped it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's like, sound check. Sound check. <laughs> the microphone is calibrated. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so it's kind of like we've been able, and it's just a really fun. Like the sound dunes are really fascinating and interesting, as a geological sort of structure. So the San Luis Valley just has a lot of really interesting things to offer. And in the mountains, you have Crestone, so you have a lot of like boodle, te- boodle, <laughs> Buddha temples. Yeah, the and, stuccos up in the yeah up around by Hooper, huh? So there's a lot or, of like uh, crystal, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of really just like interesting. It's just an interesting conglomeration of things out there. Um, it's so, kind of like um like if Sedona, Arizona, meets the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> meets Old Santa Fe. Yeah. And. Well, not it out. maybe Bermuda Triangle, but yeah, like a, a combination of like Sedona and yeah. and Roswell. Is that what you're thinking? Mm, maybe, maybe a little Roswell, maybe a little like Santa Fe. Santa Fe. like the culture and the old. Got like it, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, just put it in the highest alpine valley in in the United States, possibly even North America. I have to double check on that. But yeah. it's like base elevation 75,000 feet. Oh, wow. 7,500, yeah. Yeah, so suffice to say, very interesting place. <clears throat> Which is as high as Aspen. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I know this is like a funny aside, but those three of you visiting Colorado, um, especially if you're used to lower altitudes, take a cut like maybe a day before you just go straight to the mountains. Because mm-hmm. altitude sickness is a pretty big deal for people who are visiting. Um, and a lot of... A lot of doctors see that happen a lot. Great. With but, people who come in. Yeah, to the point like, you have heart problems, don't, don't, yeah, don't try. Especially like going from eastern Colorado, like getting off the plane and going straight to the mountains. Just give your, some, give your, your body some time to acclimate because mm. it's been rough on a couple of people. Indeed. So before we get too deep into this the, stuff. the mutilation, because I'm, I've been knee deep in it for, for the last week. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> need to need to dip our toes in a little bit and preface make this connection with a tip okay and the whole the storming the gates area 51 yes right a lot of people have noted we've already talked about like if there was anything cool there it's probably gone now mm-hmm. and so the question keeps coming up like well where is it where is the good stuff well and also, from what we know about ATIP is that, you know, this kind of decentralization, deregulation kind of thing with it. Um, one thing that we learned about the fact that it's Lockheed Skunk Works that is really the main um, operator at Area 51. Mm-hmm. And Lockheed is a, a, a contractor. They're a private company, defense contractor, that is much easier, can keep secrets much easier than the government does, hmm. right? So it's right. proprietary information. You drop a Freedom of Information Act request, it's going to go to the government. No, of course we don't have anything on UFOs. They're, we call them UAPs. <laughs> okay, now we're all the UAPs. Oh, I don't know, it's all proprietary and yeah. covered under this black project with this company. So what we do know with ATIP was that they contracted Bigelow. Robert Bigelow, the real estate mogul from Vegas, Budget budget hotels guy, big money guy, doing and wanting to do his own space program with uh, hotels in space, inflatable space habitats. Mm-hmm. We know that he uh, has sunk more of his own personal money into paranormal research than anyone else. Yeah. He he was the the funding behind the whole Skinwalker Ranch project. 
and the uh, like follow the money, right? Yeah, right. Follow the money. But so we also know that ATIP contracted SAS, Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Systems, with Skinwalker, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they also uh, remodeled one of the hangars and allegedly uh, were, were contracted to house some exotic, uh, some what's being quoted as exotic materials for the ATIP program. Hmm. Now, Lou and others who have been involved with this are are not denying that there's a crash retrieval program. Some of them are com coming right out and saying, right. yeah, there's a crash retrieval program. Others are a little more ambiguous about it and saying, well, like, I'm not saying there's not, right? Remind me what ATIP stands for again. Advanced, Advanced Aerial Threat Protection Advanced program. Aerial Threat Protection uh, program. Right now, and it's it's still operating under mm -hmm. a different name. Again, not centralized, though. Right. Um, and, yeah, there's just a lot going on with that. If you're really interested, I'm sure we'll, we'll end up doing an, a full episode on that. But uh, my there's, cousin There's Alejandro's, the connections there. Alejandro is like the pipeline for all of the information coming out about ATIP right now. So if you're really interested in that, I recommend going over to Open Minds UFO Radio, openminds.tv, read up on all the stuff going on with ATIP. There's a lot of information, way too much to cover right well, now. And what's cool about that, like just to kind of talk about like kind of interesting how distraction works or mm -hmm. how like certain things people get a hold on and then aren't like, I don't feel like there's enough attention kind of happening with this in many ways. Sure. And that's and then and this is like some fascinating stuff, especially a lot of it's being declassified, a lot mm -hmm. of it's being talked about. Right. You, I I like the term like exotic materials because in a way it kind of opens it could be, mm -hmm. it could be, be anything. anything, but there's still something strange going on. Mm -hmm. And this is the core of what it seems like um, is coming coming out about it is like the UFOs are real. Mm -hmm. We don't know who made them right. or where they're coming from or really what they're up to, but we're we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. And they've got resources that we don't and they've they've actually they've put a lot of money and uh time and effort into it and hopefully some cool stuff is going to come out of it now the connection to this mm -hmm. whole thing and and our topic tonight is bigelow because uh, at the time of this at the time of this event as you know bigelow was working with atip we didn't even know ATIP existed at this time. Right. Bigelow was investing in MUFON. Mutual Alejandro UFO I, Network, for those of you who don't know. Mutual UFO Network, yes. Uh, we were field investigators for MUFON, and Bigelow was, we'll say, courting MUFON, <laughs> in a way, to... Yeah, um, that's a good way to put it. Uh, as a, you know, recognizing that this is a, a large body that has put a lot of time and effort. It's a volunteer organization civilian organization, the only one that really actively investigates UFO sightings and reports. And they were he he was recognizing that there was something to that. So he was going to invest some money, which we later learned was actually from this government contract hmm. that he was working with ATIP on. Um, and there was a plan to develop um, what's called a star team, what they called the star team. I forget what was probably an acronym for something for the star team, like basically an elite group of MUFON investigators that was going to be handpicked and trained to go take care of the most credible uh, and evidence ridden <laughs> UFO cases and get them to Bigelow and get them the resource to get it analyzed and like just really get something good out of it. Um, and so that's what was going on when this case hit. So, shall we, yeah, shall we dive, dive in? Dive right into it. <laughs> dive. Um, dive. <laughs> into the body. Yeah, gross. Um, <clears throat> so, let, we're going to, oh, I think at the, a good place to start is just talk about the phen phenomenon in general. And so, um, we call them like mysterious animal deaths, but the most evidence we have is in relationship to cattle. Um, and specifically, like organic cattle, if you want mm. to call it organic, <laughs> right? Grass well, fed and we'll say yeah, organically raised, right? Or, yeah, you have farming practices, ranching mm -hmm. practices, right? Um, and what usually um, 
a lot of the reports talk about like um, they are missing an animal, they come across an animal, um, and they, well, one, they're dead, um, they come across them, and but what's really interesting and disturbing um, is that they have a lot of different organs removed. A lot of times it's like the udders, um, mouths, mm -hmm. the anus, things like that. Um, and what's really interesting is that they seem to be insangu insanguinated. Exsanguinated. Exsanguinated. My favorite word in the English language. Uh, <laughs> creep. <laughs> um, doesn't, it's got a nice ring to it. Like it just rolls off the tongue. I like cacophony. That's my favorite Ooh, word. Cacophony. A cacophony of exsanguination. <laughs> sure. Goth chick appreciation. <laughs> um, and... The other thing that's really odd about these um, these situations is that there's no blood around the animal, um, like there's no uh, no blood inside the body. Uh, animals avoid them; they're always left by bodies of water as well. And so those are kind of like the general sort of things that you notice with cow mutilations. And and so like when you're investigating these, it's just like really odd. Uh, in terms of, and I think Jason can speak more to some of the details. Yeah. So the particular case that Jason and Alejandro mm -hmm. went on was in 2009, mm -hmm. which I can I kind of want to research 2009, 2010 because a lot of interesting things mm -hmm. I think happened. Synchronicities. Yeah, I mean I don't know if there's anything to it or I'm just confirmation biasing it, but it just seems like a lot of weird shit went down. Um, in those years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so in terms of like your connections with like Chuck and all that, you all went down and yeah. investigated. So the the quick the quick background of it. So Chuck Zukowski, he was also a field investigator with us, and he was um, at the time a volunteer. Well, he was he he was a uh, he was a police officer in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. He was a part-time police officer um, and um, uh, software engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he um, he had come across a news report about a uh, a mysterious animal death down in San Luis Valley, and that the the authorities were at a loss about what the heck happened. And um, he used his connections as a police officer to contact the uh, sheriff's department down there and uh, in that sheriff's report he was able to describe basically what what was going on what happened so he he gave him the criminal case number uh, estimated worth of the cow was six hundred dollars cow was about 28 years old the oldest in the herd and had had a calf about three months old the cow appeared to be lying on its left side, partially in the stream near the back, near the bank, about uh, eight to twelve inches deep. Uh, the reproductive organs removed, and with the anal area still intact, the udders were removed. Wounds appeared to be circular in fashion, with noticeable cauterization of the edges, uh, with noticeable cauterization on the edges of the wound and no noticeable blood. No noticeable blood pooling except around the animal lying in the water, possibly due to saturation. Uh, the closest cow footprints to the animal was about four feet away towards the east. No noticeable vehicle, tire prints of any model or size, no indication of vehicle was nearby. The cow appeared slightly bloated, tongue and eyes were still present, flies were present, but the laying of their eggs or larva was not. The FAA was called, asking if any unusual radar contacts were noticed. None were reported. Local military was contacted, asking if military aircraft were flown during the weekend of March 8th. Military spokesmen stated that none were flown until Monday, March 9th, which was routine. The deputy stated the case was logged as unusual and open. So, Chuck got on with the with MUFON, talked to Alejandro. Uh, who at the time was also the director of public education, mm -hmm. um, and they basically, in in a way, quote unquote, deputized Chuck as a star team investigator, um, thinking we've got all of this, all these resources coming our way. This could be a really nice, juicy 
uh, tidbit to give to to give to Bigelow and get get analyzed. So we've got a got an email where we were talking about the potential of actually using using the the resources from Bigelow for this case. Yeah. What ended up happening was because it, logistically it just took a while to get everything together and for us to launch. So it was almost a week before we were able to get out there. So it ended up being Chuck Zukowski. Alejandro Rojas, myself, and uh, our friend and investigator Stacy Tussle, um, and we ended up rolling down there that following Saturday. Um, so once you kind of like got down there, what were some of the things? So it was. Um, well, and also just to got in terms of like um, history of this phenomenon, like especially in San Luis Valley, like, do you have like a ballpark number of reported cow mutilations? Ooh, that's a. I, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I know. I mean, it's the first, um, the first recognized, like publicly reported, um, uh, it, in in 1976, lady, uh, a horse was basically skeletonized from the shoulders up. Uh, the FBI were involved. CSU mm -hmm. investigated it, and again, everybody's at a loss. Like nobody knows what what happened. Um, yeah, and I was reading up somewhere that, like, um, even before that, around, like, 67, mm -hmm. um, there was, like, a report in Australia. Like, right. Shoot. Yeah, yeah. So that might – I think it's kind of interesting. Like, it doesn't seem to go – it doesn't – granted, we don't have, like, reports or who knows, but, like, in terms of reporting, it seems to only go back to about the 60s. Right. And a big part of that investigation is um, Linda Moulton Howe. Um, she, was, she was the investigator on the scene. Okay. okay? And she actually – she and um, a guy named uh, John Alsterler, uh, who's a pathologist and hematologist, wrote the section in the MUFON field manual uh, for cattle mutilations. Oh, interesting. Um, which was kind of interesting, too, because as we'll find later, uh, kind of first time investigating a cattle mutilation case, like, what you do we do? Yeah, just like we were talking about with our silver clip expedition um this was kind of like a uh where do we start what yeah. do we do well i think that's interesting um like just a moment to talk about like i guess science in some way sometimes it's like you have to fail a lot mm -hmm. and screw up the science before yeah. we kind of figure it out <laughs> right yep a lot of failure before any any kind of success comes your way yeah so the scene was pretty much as advertised we got there and it was you know it was a nice uh, I guess we got there in the morning. It was a nice warm day, nice March, Colorado yeah. day. Um, and the cow was, poor thing, was lying kind of maybe halfway in the river on her side at, at the base of a slope. It was a pretty steep slope that led up to the the road. Okay. So it was basically, you've got the road, slope, cow, and then little little stream. So no indication that the cow might have been like pushed off the slope right uh there, there's a lot of vegetation along the slope and so they would have been able been to disturbed, track it right mm -hmm. so even if she was walking up there or something and slipped fell right there would be evidence there of would that. be there would be evidence so it's almost everything all of the measurements we took all of the the uh pictures everything shows that this cow is just suddenly there there's no footprints there's no of, of people or animals within four feet that's always sound, no. sound, sound dip moment. Um, no evidence of being dragged. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, especially too, like if there's a carcass and it's a good carcass, immediate. Mm -hmm. You know, pre you know, scavengers will pick at exactly. it. Exactly. And this is a week later. And nothing has been picked at. And nothing. Well, a little, very, very minor. Very so there minor. was some picking at like the the head and ears a little bit, but nothing to the level that it should be for being out for a week. Well, and that's interesting, too, because, like, in terms of our March, so it's a little cooler, so we could be preserved a little bit longer than if it was in the hot sun. So in terms of just, like, decomposition within a week, well, it was, was it starting to decompose? Was so it was it, bloated. It was bloated. Right? So there was some, but again... Um, not to the extent not, it should be. Not the extent it should be, right? Like, it was, it was weird. Now, keeping in mind, like, so this kind of environment, it's not a consistent... Consistent temperatures. If right. Anybody who's not from Colorado is listening. Um, you have to understand that 
it's kind of a desert environment and this high altitude thing that uh, like there's there's a, a stark difference between sunlight and shadow uh temperature wise so when it's dark it gets pretty cool right and when it's when the hot, sun's out it gets hot. really hot <laughs> And this is a this actually plays a factor too because we brought a Geiger counter. Um, so basically, what we what we did was we're we're taking measurements, right? Um, one of the things that we were told because we contacted um, Nancy Talbot of BLT Research, she's an uh, uh, expert in crop circles and. She's worked with a little bit in the in the cattle mutilations too, because it's an agricultural anomaly. But the the primary thing is that w was really interesting was that she found some parallels between the crop circles and the cattle mutilations. In terms of the the Geiger meter. So Geiger kind of some of the some of the orientation kind of things. So taking samples like soil samples at certain intervals, right? But um, what's particularly uh, notable in in the cattle mutilation cases that she pointed out was brown blood on the animal's hide or carcass hmm. right it's noted noted that a lot of times this is found um which was tested to be bovine hemoglobin another really weird thing that you can't just like <laughs> diy hemoglobin out in the field um it's plasma. so explain so explain um what, what you mean by hemoglobin so and like why it's, it's so intriguing or interesting in terms of the situation yeah so bovine hemoglobin uh, it's it's blood plasma mm -hmm. so it's a uh, the part of the blood that has a lot of the um, kind of the, the the good stuff the grit of the blood mm -hmm. right uh and something else that came up later in my follow-up with Nancy, I talked to her, and she told me about some other things that had been found in the soil, um, some of the soil samples with crop circles in particular, and also with the cattle mutilations was the presence of micrometeorites, or spheroids, consisting of iron, hmm. meteoric iron, um, different types of uh, hematite, and magnetic hematite, and magnetite. The cool thing about the presence of uh, magnetic hematite is that it's not a naturally, generally not a naturally occurring thing. It needs hematite in order to become magnetized. It needs to be heated up and cooled down really fast. So in terms of like another kind of added anomaly to this whole picture is mm -hmm. just the presence of those minerals in the, in the site. Right. And their concentration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and with, so like... Sorry, excuse me. So in terms of like painting a picture, could these materials be in the area naturally and then some sort of outside element heating and cooling? Or does it need to be transported from somewhere else? Sure. Uh, it's possible like m m theoretically it could be, say, like a, a, a meteorite, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a piece of a meteor comes in and impacts and, you know, is molten and... Does it to hematite. Right, right. So like if there is hematite in that meteorite, okay. right? And then it comes, it's all molten, hits the ground, pops, blows up, and spreads out, right? That's a theory on how that could exist naturally, okay. right? Again, we did not find, as far as I'm aware, any evidence of that here in this case. Okay. I do remember it being discussed, though, and going back, looking at my notes, we didn't have any, like, uh, any any notes on that in the in the. Uh, analyzation of it so I do, just do I do remember that being a part of the conversation so what we did was um, we took samples based on based on the MUFON field manual um, we took samples cut pieces out around the the edges of the wounds um, we did confirm that the uterus and vaginal tract were missing mm -hmm. we took kind of inch sized uh, square cuts of the uh, flesh around the wounds. We inspected the insides as best we could uh, and confirmed that there were no larvae. There were still no no bugs or or And explain larva. why that's weird. Because <laughs> it's a dead body yeah. and the maggots get in quick. If you've ever left, you would leave, leave, a, leave a piece of meat out overnight or something, you know, especially, mm -hmm. you know, like in... In, in a warm place, right, or a place where they're all hanging out. Bugs, bugs get in there, yeah. right? So, yeah, that was weird and creepy. 
And we took... We I find took, it interesting that, like, what's creepy in many ways about the situation is a lack of, like... We, we have a tendency to think of, like, decomposition and death as sort of, like, this creepy, weird thing. Mm -hmm. But it's also an incredibly, like, natural necessity. So, mm -hmm. like, you die and you get picked by the birds or, mm -hmm. like, you know, whatever Karen decomposers are out there hanging out. You know, the worms come in and take over. You know, like, nature kind of comes in to, like, claim that body. And what's so kind of creepy and eerie about these experiences is just how quiet and still and like suspended yeah. in time. Right. Um, these, ex these, these phenomenon are, especially with these, um, mutil mutilated animals. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That, that was the feeling I think that we all got was like, this is, it's weird. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, so, you know, there's a long history of, of ranching here in this area. Right? Yeah. There's, uh, this is experienced. Um, this is an experienced professional rancher, um, and he and his. Uh, so Mike Duran was the name of the rancher. Um, he's the one that he was there with us while we were looking at things. He was showing us around. His ranch hand came out and talked to us too, and we, you know, both of these guys have been around ranching their entire lives. They had worked with cattle for a very long time, and they know what a dead animal is supposed to look like. Right. right? They know their herd, and they know their land. Their behavior and kind of right? where they are. And so it, you know, if they recognize it as strange enough to call the police, right, to mm -hmm. call and also and not try to prosecute a cattle rustling, because that's a big thing too, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's actually kind of an epidemic. Think of like, <laughs> I've talked to I other people. Your cow. That are, you stole my cow. Yeah, right. <clears throat> like you stole my cow a, back. <laughs> that's an old west, right? That's an old west problem, right? Well, yeah, it still happens. It still happens. Yeah, this is this is the wild west still, <laughs> in in a lot of ways. Yeah, so we took our samples. We also took soil samples. Get looking for those, looking for whatever might be in there. Yeah. Fingers crossed for spheroids, right? <laughs> Um, steroids oh yeah the, the, yeah the things tiny the tiny, tiny little balls steroids. of of metal steroids yeah that's a cool name yeah band name right yeah we album should what should we yeah. <laughs> exactly we yeah. needed animals album album or band name band name steroid is probably the band name steroid like would be the, the band steroids name or the band and uh Cow what mutilation. strange animal death would be the album the album yeah so for all you punk rockers out there, there we go. We've just, we just. Uh... That's that's our band, and we should like do a do a run of it. Like, <laughs> what's the the band name and album cover for this episode? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, what else did we do? Uh, Stace and I did some dowsing of mm -hmm. the area, actually, kind of before before we really knew. How to douse? Because, I mean, we, we didn't know what we were looking for. Yeah. Right? yeah like, okay, what are we going to find? What are we looking for? As we know with dowsing, um, and of course, we can do a we can do an episode on dowsing. Um, Janae and I have studied it and had practiced with it a little bit. And it seems to have some, some good success if you do know exactly what it is you're looking for. Mm -hmm. In this case, we didn't know. We didn't know what we were looking for, so uh, we didn't really get anything out of that. Uh, we also took some compass readings, see if there was any kind of like a magnetic anomaly, and Chuck had a Geiger counter. And interesting point, if you don't, have you ever used a Geiger counter? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what What for? Well, I think during, and then I'm thinking of like the dowsing rod, uh, we, I, who was the guy who came in and kind of told us all about it? He was like an Greg oil. Greg Storzik. Yeah, because he was a big, um, he found water a lot, mm -hmm. like oil wells and um, water wells and different things like that. Um, and I think I remember him showing one. Um, the Geiger counter? I just, I'm, we trying to Geiger counter? I'm trying to remember. I know like I, we've played around with it, but it's been my memory. You know, it's like 10 years ago now. Right. So... Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember if we ever used a Geiger. But I don't counter, think I don't we've think ever we used. One. We didn't. We didn't have one, so we've never like used one in our investigations because they're bulky and right. expensive. And Chuck's the kind of guy that's just got one. Yeah, of around, course. Because why? Why not? Right. And like yeah, 
Geiger counters, and we can edit this out if we need to, just in case I'm wrong and don't want to look like a dumbass, um, <laughs> measures radiation in, in the area, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you take some, you, you have to take readings to determine what the ambient, like what's the natural radiation in the area. Yeah. And then um, you're, so you have a baseline reading, so you know what's normal, and then you run it over your uh, area of interest to determine if, if there are any anomalies. Yeah. So the problem with that was, um, so this we have this problem that this planet is orbiting a giant ball that's just constantly emitting radiation, just bombarding <laughs> us with radiation. It sure is today. <laughs> and then what happens is the ground soaks up all that radiation and then releases it, it the, and, the and emanates it. So it was it was not um, we weren't able to get anything out of that because yeah. we were in a in a pool of <laughs> ambient radiation um, that we couldn't determine any. I mean, well, and I think that's like a good thing to kind of talk about in general because I think in terms of kind of a lot of the materials that we use to collect evidence and a lot of um, people's perception of it because of media or Hollywood or whatnot. I think the Geyer counter so much is like such a clear instrument in a lot of people's minds mm -hmm. without realizing how um, particular it is mm -hmm. and how delicate it is and how you have to be really careful with playing around with it and like setting like a control or a baseline right. is really important. Well, and that's the thing with any kind of science. Yeah. Right? We do the same thing with ghost hunting. We do the same thing with, with uh, you know, UFOs, Bigfoot, any any kind of thing we're, we're studying. Um, you got to know how to use the equipment. Yeah. Right. And a lot of us don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's some of some of these items need some special training or just some like experience with it. Yeah. Right? Like yeah, what are we even of, looking at? Yeah. Or or what are how are we doing that? So yeah. So those are always important things to kind mm -hmm. of note. Yep. So we did all that and we we interviewed we interviewed Mike and the ranch hand. and uh, we. He thinks he thought it was it was aliens, hmm. like. Yeah, so I guess it's like another good way to segue is like, what do people think this mm -hmm. is? Well, so based on the fact that Mike Duran had had a sighting of his own, he had seen a silver uh, a silver ball cruising out over the ridge uh, uh, down and down around the valley around his land. He also a neighbor rancher had seen some strange lights in the area around his land the night that this actually went down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people see lights in the sky, people see silver balls dancing around, they're, you know, UFO plus unexplained yeah. animal death yeah. uh, equals aliens, Alien. right? Yeah. Um, I still don't know. I don't know. Well, and that's like, it kind of leads into, you know, like what it could be, but then also like, why leave evidence? Mm -hmm. Why leave the cow? Why place it there? Right. You know, there's in so many of these cases, they seem to be very strategically placed, like they want to be found. Mm -hmm. Or they just don't, they don't, don't care. care. Whoever's doing this does not just care. Just doesn't care. They are bold and blatant enough to do this, you know. Like, kind of it's like they're just thing. like taking out the trash or just dumping. Yeah, who knows? Like, that's the crazy thing. So, whatever whatever is doing this and why ever they're doing it, um, it, it raises these questions. Like, what what is going on? First of all, the how. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to think about this is this happened at night, quickly with a very large animal that weighs a lot, mm -hmm. and leaving no evidence of a struggle. No evidence of uh, taking it apart. Right, right. Like, um, because like based on kind of what you're seeing and noticing, especially with the cauterization, um, the removal, you know, they have to have taken it. The the them, whoever the them is, um, has to take it somewhere to do what they need to do, mm -hmm. and then they have to take it and bring it back. And right. like drop it off. And that's like the part that I always find kind of just even if they don't care and mm -hmm. they're just like dumping, for example. Sure. It seems easier to like get rid of it a different way mm -hmm. than to transport it all the way back. Sure. I don't know. Unless it's, it's done on site. Yeah, but then why no evidence? Right. Well, so um this and what we'll see too is with the Miller case, 
um, which is uh, the next one that happened. So we didn't even get this analyzed yet. Yeah. Before another case uh, popped hit. up. Yeah, and it hit like just a day or two later. Yeah, it was as just you were a there. couple days later, and so you were Chuck still there. was well. No, we came back, okay. and Chuck went down on his own. He got he got the like the pipeline and just mm-hmm. went right back down and and checked it out on his own. This one was crazy because it was a calf and it was basically from from the the hip to the shoulders was nothing but spine like everything the organs the like the center midsection of this animal was just gone gone that's so weird and um, i remember those pictures too they are not fun so yeah. listeners just you know warning you know they're not fun to look at so right. if you this is a horror show yeah like this is it gets into your brain and, and fucks with you a little bit so if, just be prepared if this is a like a line or track of thought you're thought you're going to take care of yourself <laughs> right 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 right. Like, because what's so creepy is like we don't know mm-hmm. and this is happening right like it's easy to be desensitized like okay yeah i mean you know you, you see like like PETA videos, like shock, mm-hmm. shock value, trying to scare people to be vegetarians, and like, uh, <laughs> uh, like what we do to animals and stuff. Like, but like this, this is different. It just is, this yeah. It's just weird. And well, because it's like you can kind of put like what I think with those things, and especially when people are trying to kind of get people to stop eating meat, or let's go down that road of like, you know, PETA. Is that in some ways we know who's doing the harm. Uh Um, And for some reason that desensitizes us in some ways. It's like humans are doing the whatever. And so we we know where it's coming from and how it's happening and why it's happening. Uh In terms of this, it's just why Uh and where and how and what. None of those, you can't, we can't answer them. Uh And the the idea too, what what else is unsettling too when like it really sinks in? Like this is food, right? You think of how much of the population, um, for better or worse, mm-hmm. like or as, especially as Americans, like yeah. we eat a lot of meat, we eat a lot of beef. Um, that thing even crossing over into the crop circles, like those are cereal crops. Those are uh, these <laughs> yeah, and I think that's like something. A... And someone is well, and like I know we're kind of going on a tangent, and I think that's okay. But um, just in terms of one thing that I always found really creepy or like hard to digest with these cases too is like how like genetically comparable to humans like uh, bovine are. So if you wanted, you know, if we wanted to go completely out there and start thinking like really horror horrifying thoughts just the idea of like genetic mini, um, mini, um mutation you know like mm-hmm. you could incubate a human baby right yeah and a cow uh, as a matter of fact yes in uh, in the past bovine hemoglobin was used for in uh, a different type of artificial insemination yeah treatment. so that's kind of that makes you think about all that other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, there's different ways to synthesize that, right? right. Like, we, it's not necessary. It's kind of an adequated way technology. to do that, right? But if we think of, like, technologies and, like, you know, biomedical science in mm-hmm. general, mm-hmm. DNA, you know, well, those sorts of things, it's just, it's, your brain could go in very dark places right. quickly. Right, and it does also, stuff. like, raise the question of, like, what the the... The connections with the actual organs that are removed, mm-hmm. right? Like, well, and we can we can guarantee that it's always going to be female, right? For the most part. Um, if it is if it is male, then the it's the it's the so the, it's always some sort of the reproductive organs mm-hmm. are always yep. missing. Yep. It's the, the 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 lively bits. <laughs> even uh, and actually even from a from a magical line of thinking uh-huh. like take this route for example and which i kind of have a theory around that too like uh, a lot of talk of like um so aliens and mad science but what doesn't really come up too much is this like black magic mayhem possibility yeah. right yeah um and even especially in this area you know there's a tradition of brujeria mm-hmm. um and so from a magical line of thinking, um, what is the most, uh, the most potent juices in, <laughs> in any being is the blood yeah. and the, you know, reproductive the, the reproductive, right? The, 
Um, you look at the semen and the, the the eggs, right? The uterus, like this is the the creation of life, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the sustaining then, of life. So like, then, from a magical perspective, how are they cutting all this off? I don't know. No. <laughs> you get an enchanted dagger. An enchanted dagger. Oh right? my gosh. <laughs> an enchanted dagger or a laser scalpel. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe combine it's, it's 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 both magic and science. It's like yeah, magical right? science. They combine the two somehow and have <laughs> gone advanced with their like their magic. Crazy steampunk that just snapped and snapped somewhere <laughs> fell right off <laughs> mm. fell right off the edge into that black hole in abyss well and so to address that as far as our case back here with mike duran um so chuck was able to make a connection with a professor at csu the uh university of colorado um state. colorado state university yep um which is actually one of the uh preeminent uh, veterinary yeah. schools in the country. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Um, representatives from CSU investigated the whole the lady case back in the 70s. 70s. Uh, and what they determined was basically um, very, very bare bones. You can read in our source report on the blog. Uh, Alejandro wrote out verbatim in their words what happened but basically the the quick assessment in plain english was that um colleen duncan the professor of anatomic pathology pointed out that without a full necropsy and this is very important with this whole case um, and a necropsy is basically an autopsy on an animal Mm -hmm. anything that's not a human is a necropsy and without a veterinarian there's not a whole lot you can determine Mm -hmm. from just these samples that we took that said they were able to determine that the the wounds were post mortem. So that's interesting. So death and then right. removal. So that yes. So at least hopefully the animal did not suffer. The, she did not die from the wounds. Right. right? Well, that's good. Enough. Um. Whatever. Whatever the case, she was dead when all this terrible stuff happened to her. Um. And. Uh, they, but they don't know what the cause of death was, um, and that the they they could not tell if they were cauterized or not because of the 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 length of time. Yes, yeah, so and the length of exposure. Could right. Have... So it's possible they could have been cauterized, but what they think was that with the um, sheriff's deputy thought was cauterization was that it was just dried and like exposed flesh right um, that may have appeared to be cauterized but again we can't we can't know for sure um, the other thing was um, kind of a a very important note to make and again lesson learned um, no who uh, talk to the talk to whoever to is going to be doing first. your analyzation yeah. before you take your samples, because we have a, a one page general like how to in the MUFON field manual uh, instructing us to take these samples and put them in basically an alcohol solution. In this case, um, it actually caused damage and degradation to the samples. Yeah, so we yeah. and. Yeah, so, accurate. You can get accurate mm-hmm, reads on mm-hmm. the samples because of that. Right, right. So they would have had us put it in different, different kind of, um, different kinds of uh, um, solution to preserve it in a way that accommodated what they were going to do to test it and analyze it. So mm-hmm. again, lesson learned there. Something that Chuck was able to um, apply the lesson to later on down the road as he got a flood, you know, case after case after yeah, cause case. Yeah, because this really started a, bra- a barrage of, of um, stuff, I yeah. think, for a good year. That's why I'm like, mm-hmm. 2009, 2010, right. like, what was going on? Right. Because it was like, for a while, it was like, Chuck kept getting case after case after mm-hmm. case mm-hmm. for good, like, six months to a year. Right. 
and I went I went back with him to the Miller Ranch uh, to go take a look um, a little later. So I didn't get to see uh, the actual um, the, the body of that calf. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what he had, there was a follow up. He had had another animal that was um, mutilated that we went down to check out mm-hmm. there. Um, kind of similar situation, um, but it, yeah. Again, crazy, crazy things. Yeah. Um, and Chuck is actually, um, you can hear, he, he's doing the Alien Highway show now on the Travel Channel. Hmm. Um, so he's got a little more information on that, too, if you want to go check that out. Um, but again, here at this, going back to the... 2009 yeah this is like i think this is the creepiest thing that i have ever investigated firsthand right yeah i can imagine um it's not only i I remember being like nope i'm not going yeah i like flat out was like i think i had an i I don't know if i'm remembering it correctly but i think i had an opportunity to go down Mm -hmm. and i just like i was like nope i'm sure i invited you when chuck yeah because chuck's great to work with and you know i was intrigued but i was like nah yeah, I'm good. Right. You can sit this one out and like most everybody else did. Everyone, um, did, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, I, I think, because like we really start to think about it and you start to like, we would do a lot of analyzing of secondhand of stuff and mm-hmm. kind of like looking at reports and looking at just cases and different things like that and following the trail. Yeah. I was even trying to figure out a way that we could analyze it too. Yeah. Like get a second. Yeah. Just kind of like at thing, MSU but... um, where we're at, because it, at that time, I think we had a bit more like sciencey people who could have really looked at stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I mean, we have a biology department, but like yeah. as far as like we can sync with DNA or something. Yeah. Right? But like nothing like that. But so it's just, but yeah, it was one of those things. Things like um, and that's kind of interesting. I've noticed myself in general in terms of investigation. I kind of said no to a lot. I was like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. It's which is interesting because I think now I have the capacity to kind of like do that kind of work without, you know, being too like being bothered, but mm-hmm. also not feeling like I'm gonna get attacked or you know like I don't know. I'm less paranoid in some ways. But you think like was the concern like for your own. Like well, just like self-preservation, yeah, kind definitely. Of like your mental, like yeah, mental self-preservation yeah. for sure. Also, too, this is just like um, seeing anything dead or a corpse mm-hmm. is difficult. I mean, I've seen them for sure, but you know, in terms of you know, like and knowing about it and reading about it is a lot different than going on an investigation and seeing it live, right? Because right. It, then it's real, right? Yeah. There's this level of you see evidence or you read an article and you can kind of pass it off. Well, maybe somebody, maybe it's a hoax. Maybe someone forged it or, you yeah. know, there's like a level of like, yeah, I really doubt that that's actually right. cauterized or things like that. But when you're kind of faced with that, it's totally live different evidence, when it's real. It's, right? it's different. And when like it's when real. you can be on a ghost hunt and be like, okay, whatever, boring. Like this is all it is. Whatever. We're yeah. Yeah. Set up some equipment. But and then you, something happens. Yeah. Right. Then you're like, if you've ever actually seen a UFO, if you've ever actually encountered one of the, you know, something well, yeah, strange something that just you can't strange. explain. And you can't explain it. It's really, and that's really, I think not knowing is a lot harder in some ways. Um, and why I think people try to fill in the gaps. And it's really hard to just be kind of like, I don't know what it is, but it's fucking weird. Mm-hmm. I think that's really hard for humans to do. Like, and, it's incredibly and to leave difficult. It and just an to leave, unexplained. And right? to leave it like that. And I think that's why so many people are cl- like clamor around to explain things. And I think that's why we get so caught up in all of this like misinformation a lot of mm-hmm. times. When really, like, the evidence is creepy enough. Right. You know? Like, I, I see that all the time with, like, people trying to explain, like, these big, huge – like, the the moon landing. It's mm-hmm. probably – it was a lot harder to fake it than to just be there. Right. Like, I, I said this last night at, like, a paper and pencil game, but the whole Sherlock Holmes thing is, like, as improbable as it is. You know, like, once you've, like – gotten i know i'm not as i'm not eloquent like him but once you get rid of all the evidence like as improbable as it may be is probably the answer hmm. and i think occam's razor occam's yeah occam's razor yeah which is totally that is totally a punk band name yeah that has to it has to be somebody do that right now um <laughs> that's so true i like that's a great um and so it's just kind of 
I don't I and I think sometimes we get lost in trying to figure out the why and explain like well this must be a conspiracy for this and that and that when really like nonfiction the nonfiction elements of it are just more intriguing Mm -hmm. you know if we really strip away all those narratives it's like what the hell and what's fascinating too a lot of times is that like you let it go for a little while right and then there's like another little piece of the puzzle that pops up Mm -hmm. so even thinking like connecting it back to a tip and bigelow and just kind of following the money a little bit is that there was like a connection at the time Mm mm-hmm And then how many years later we find out about that connection. So it makes you wonder even more, right? Like why were they thinking of investing money and Mm -hmm. what did they want to get out of it? Right. Um, And so it creates even more questions. Like we still don't know. Um, And we might never know. Or we might find some crazy revelation. Revelation and just like our brains will be fucked. Yeah. Um, and maybe one of those co- well, people who are like, you know, conspiring. <laughs> I, 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 and I don't mean to like, I just, I think, and I should make a note here that I think the de- there's definitely been a lot of conspiracies that have been accurate, like the Tuscan G Airmen experiments, like syphilis experiments. Tuskegee Airmen? Thank you. Gosh. Um, I always, and so like, I try to be open minded about it, but I think sometimes people get a little too down certain trains of thought right um and a little too what's the word like um evangelical about it sure yeah Um, they they it's an opportunity to uh further an agenda yeah and so it's it's like a cultish mentality that you can manipulate information to suit your your agenda yeah yeah. and so that's where i i kind of when i talk about and, and talk about conspiracy and things like that, that I sometimes sound the way I do because I'm very critical of them because of how much misinformation gets spread by mm-hmm. a lot of this. Like, I understand we don't trust our government. We sure. don't trust, we don't, we, we really feel like we're being the wolves over our eyes. And there, I think there's a lot of those elements. Um, but I think we need to be very healthy in mm-hmm. sort of the way information. And while I say, yeah, I mean, yeah. conspiracies do exist, mm-hmm. right? But a lot of the, you know, this like, there's there's um, the sinister like mm-hmm. the sinister kind of things that um, people are speculating about, um, kind of rely on hyper competence, right? Like the big, the big, yeah, like you know, nine eleven's an inside job kind of thing. Like how many pieces need have to have been in place? For that to really have gone, like, did was it allowed to happen? Was it an opportunist event? Maybe. Well, and I think but like a full-on false flag. Like, and then I think people kind of use opportunity more than like sure. brand manipulation. Right. And on the other side of that, the cover-ups, I think, from what I've seen, is more to cover up the fuck up, right? Mm-hmm. Like they screwed up royally, and they're trying to, you know, yeah, Bem- backpedal and and figure out how to how to make it look like they didn't mess up quite so bad so like if there's a conspiracy that's probably usually what it is but you know and then i always try to say but who knows the world is a very strange odd fucked up place Mm -hmm. and mysterious and wonderful and interesting i should say in the same token because i don't i don't think that everything i don't know Anyway, that's like another conversation for another podcast but i just kind of wanted to, to mention that as well that like I, I think we just need to be careful in terms of like we want answers and we want a story, um, and we don't like we don't get to have that a lot of times. In fact, I I don't think we've ever had closure on a podcast. No, I think every podcast <laughs> every end, episode every podcast has ended with and we don't know. It's a, it's, it's, it's a weird, right? Like, <laughs> but we don't know what happened. <laughs> what happened? Join us next time, time. for the exciting <laughs> non-conclusion. The non-conclusion, the ever the... non-conclusion of different things. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Which maybe that would be kind of a cool thing. Like, let's we could do something that's like here was something really odd that turned out to be not odd. Oh, we do have one. Which the, was the, the Bailey Bigfoot. <gasps> oh yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Are you doing? Yeah. Can we do a whole whole episode on that one? Yeah, where the joke is like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. All right. We 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 might. We'll see. 
if you're listening, <laughs> if you're listening out there, let us know. Do you want do you want us to do a story where there's actually a conclusion, <laughs> or or do you like the mystery, or do we like sticking with the mystery? Which is funny. I kind of imagine myself as if I was listening to this, being like, oh, <laughs> oh no, that's it. That's what that's we'll it. do. That's no, where we're ending. The Patreon. So we're gonna do. We're we're talking oh, about yeah. doing Patreon. So all right. Um, so that could be one of our once once we launch like, Patreon. Yeah, like once we start getting funding that, and that stuff, we've got to be unlocked. Like yeah, special content. Yeah, special content. You'll get you'll get to hear so a about a case where we actually came to a conclusion, <laughs> figured out what the mystery was, um, along with um, some other things. We're gonna we're we're looking at doing some merch. We're gonna be celebrating 13 years, dude. Yeah. 13. That's quite remarkable. Lucky 13. We well, and it's it. cool too because we got a lot of uh, new blood in terms of just kind of running with it, which is nice because I, I am very much a vice president. I don't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> you, yes, you do. You, you keep me in line, and uh, you, you, you agree with me <laughs> when you need to, and you um, challenge me. Okay. Getting too crazy. And then I get to do the fun shit called the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, no, no. Uh, but to all, all, all jokes aside, I think like the new blood has been really helpful in terms of their, and also giving a place for people who are really passionate about this stuff, so I don't have to worry about right kind of where it, where it's going or headed. I can just have some fun. You've earned the right to to sit back a little sit bit. Sit back and watch. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Maybe I can create a conspiracy theory about me. Mm. See how far it travels. Actually, no, I really don't want that to happen. <laughs> that would be interesting. That's when you know you've arrived. Yeah, There's yeah. There's a conspiracy theory about you. <laughs> 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 but anyway, that said, so exciting. Keep an eye out. We're going to be launching Patreon. Yeah. Also, hopefully this episode is going to be out in time. But if you are in Denver... And you want to come see a cool event, come to the Indigenous Pop Expo, which is formerly Indigenous Comic Con. Uh, but basically, it's a Comic Con. It's a, it's a celebration of all popular culture and Indigenous contributions to it. Mm -hmm. so, so I won't be hanging out there, but Jason will be. <laughs> no, you're coming. Oh. But, I'm right? hanging in the I'm hanging in the back. You can, you're, you're, when is it again? An ally. It's next Saturday. Oh shit. Saturday. No, Sunday. Sorry. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday, um, July twenty eighth. What time? One p.m. Okay. Thirteen hundred. Okay. Thirteen hundred hours. Oh yeah, that's right. I said I'd help, but yeah. I would be a ghost <clears throat> in the shadows. No, see, you are a supportive ally. I'm supportive ally. Yeah, yeah, I won't be talking though. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, paranormal investigating from an indigenous perspective, which technically, um, yeah, so Heishi and I uh, are going to be discussing how we uh, apply our indigenous knowledge teachings to investigating the paranormal. And so it's going to be a good time, good show, and come out and show your support for your uh your indigenous relatives, your native relatives in pop culture. It'll be mm -hmm. a good time. It'll be fun. Yeah. I'm really glad that it's going on. It should be fun. And we're going to do another live cast, and I will actually hit the record button this time. <laughs> so if you're not able to physically be there, um, you you can, can listen, listen in live, tune in live, give us all the stars. and That'd be uh, cool if we had, like, lapel recorders. Yeah. One day. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. This we're we're gonna try to try to get because we're operating on pretty much um anti Zero an dollars. anti budget. <laughs> we have an anti budget. <laughs> with teetering yeah. On the edge. Jason's using his pilot headphones right now mm -hmm. to record. Actually, the pilot headset. The wires are crossed. I'm gonna have to go in there and like rewire it because the way it's rigged on the plane, the 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 earphones are actually the microphone, and the microphone is the yeah. earphone. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. So we're jerry-rigging this rig for sure. <laughs> so help us. We need, <laughs> we need money for microphones so that we can continue to, to whisper horrors, The nonsense in your hair. Horrors. Nonsense in your, in your hair. <laughs> cool. 
on that note, um, have a lovely evening, everyone. Keep yourselves cool in this heat. If you're if you're in a place where it's hot, there's a massive heat wave. So make sure you're taking care of you and others in the community because it's going to be hitting some people hard. Thank you for that, Janine. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So have a lovely so have a lovely week, and we will be back shortly. With some more.